Hello, my name is Tim Clark, and this is Conversations About the Vietnam War. My special guest today is Doug Toskey, and Doug was a graduate of Renton High School in 1964. Uh, he was an athlete at school and uh, managed to actually gain all state recognition in both football and baseball, is that correct? Yes. Um, and uh, with that, you won a football scholarship to WSU. That's correct, yeah. All right, and uh, so off you go to WSU. What happens? I played football for about a year and a half and uh, determined that I really wasn't going to make a long-term career out of that, given my size and weight at the time. Uh, so I gave up my scholarship after about a year and a half. And uh, at that point, uh, because you were in a high-profile athletic uh, endeavor, they limited the number of hours you could take. That's correct. We were only allowed to take 12 hours a semester, and I think uh, probably for the students it uh, would be good to clarify something. Uh, currently, y y you have what's termed an all-volunteer army, where people volunteer to go in the military, and that's how the army is run currently, or any of the services at this point. It's totally voluntary. During Vietnam, because of the need for the number of troops that they had in Vietnam, they had what was called the draft. And the draft was, once you were 18 years of age, then your name would go into uh, the federal government, and then they would select your name uh, to enter the military. So it wasn't really voluntary, per se. Uh, there were a number of people that did volunteer, but others were conscrip conscripted or drafted uh, to go into the military at that point. But you could get a college deferment, is that correct? That's correct, but it was based on the number of hours that you uh, were allowed, that you were taking. During my, during the football season at Washington State University or any of the universities, we were only allowed to take about 12 hours because of the time commitment that existed with regard to the football program. At mid-year, my sophomore year, what happened was they changed the number of hours that were required for the deferment, which left me three hours short of being able to maintain my student deferment. Okay, so at that point, you're at a decision point in your life. You have to decide what you're gonna do. What did you decide to do? Well, that's correct. and and. It, I decided that I wanted to continue in college even though I didn't have a number of hours. So there was an opportunity that opened up with regard to the Reserve Officer Training Corps or ROTC program at both at WSU and all the other universities, which allowed you to go to a basic training, a regular Army basic training, which I went to at Fort Knox, Kentucky in the summer, that summer, and then enter the Reserve Officer Training Corps as a junior. And that allowed you then to uh, stay in the program for two years and obtain your commission in the Army as a lieutenant at that point in time. Okay. So you, uh, you went ahead and you obtained your degree. What was your degree in? I had a degree in business with a specialization in marketing. Okay. And now it comes time to obviously fulfill that military obligation. So where do you go? Well, I graduated in, uh, in 1968 uh, and went in the military. Uh, I had to go to what was called officer basic course, which meant I had to go get trained in a specific combat arm, in my case, because I was going to go on to flight school uh, beyond that. So I ended up at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, being trained as an artillery officer. And I was there from February of 1969 until uh, June or July of 1969. All right, so just for clarification, were you to not be successful in flight school, you automatically went back to your assignment as a combat officer? That's correct. If you failed flight school or flunked out of flight school, as we used to say, uh, and I'm sure your students are familiar with the term flunk. Uh, <laughs> We uh, would have ended up going over to Vietnam, and I would have been a forward, observ forward uh, observer in the artillery area. Okay, but things went well. Off you go to primary school at? Primary rotary helicopter wing, or primary rotor school, or rotary wing school, which is helicopter, basic helicopter school at Fort Walters, Texas. All right, and uh, eventually you're gonna come out of there in August? Uh, no. I, we. 
began school at the beginning of August. I flew home to Renton here and uh, got married on August 2nd, and my wife and I honeymooned at the uh, Holiday Inn in Mineral Wells, Texas for two days uh, before I started flight school August 3rd or August 4th. All right, so uh, Carol uh, obviously finds herself in a foreign land too then. Yeah, very foreign land, and uh, we couldn't afford to stay in the hotel very long, so we sent her out to, to find housing for us, and we ended up uh, with about a, a, a trailer that had an extra 10 feet length and supposedly had central air conditioning, which you really need in Texas, to be honest with you, in August of any year. So. All right, so, uh, and one other oddity in your little journey here. Uh, you actually, uh, by now, I mean, we're, uh, we've gone through the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. There's heavy examination of the issues in Vietnam, and there are people that are opposing the war in Vietnam. That's correct, and to be very frank with you, uh, I was one of those people opposed. Uh, while I was on leave to go to Vietnam, after I completed flight school, I actually marched in a march on the freeway here in Seattle in opposition to the war in Vietnam. But the fact is, you did come from a family that uh, had a military background, is that That's correct? That's correct. My father had uh, served in World War II and was wounded in France right after the D-Day invasion. All right, so and you get that concept that nevertheless, when duty is present, you will do your duty. Yes. I. I couldn't see myself. Uh, to avoid the draft, a number of people went up to Canada. I couldn't see myself doing that. I wanted to live in the United States, and the only way to deal with it was to go ahead and serve my country. All right, so off you go to Advanced Rotary School. Where is that? And uh, Advanced Rotary Wing School was at Fort Rucker, Alabama. Uh, and what's the basic difference between primary? The basic difference was uh, when we were learning to fly, we flew two-person two helicopters. And then when we got to the advanced school, we were put into what's called a Huey, which was an aircraft that was very popular during the Vietnam, not just Vietnam, but actually probably up until about seven or eight years ago was the workhorse for the Army with regard to uh, rotary wing aviation. Okay, so this is what we call the air cab. Uh, uh, well, it would be fun. similar to air cab, but uh, they're Air cab units were a specific unit, uh, and there were a lot of other units. Uh, and when I went to Vietnam, I actually was in what's called the 57th Assault Helicopter Company, which meant that we did uh, troop insertion, uh, medevac, uh, resupply of bases, and that kind of thing. In fact, when you first arrived, now you arrived in Vietnam in May, is that right? May of 1970. But uh, almost immediately find yourself supporting the 4th Infantry, and what are they doing? Yes, the unit I was assigned to, the 57th Assault Helicopter Company, was t assigned temporary duty with the 4th Infantry Division. And if you, if you went back and looked at history books, that was the month that the United States decided to invade Cambodia. What's the target in Cambodia? Uh, basically, all the troop movement from the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, and coming south uh, went through either Laos or Cambodia. Uh, normally they didn't travel through Vietnam. There was a road called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which referred to the leader of North Vietnam. And almost all the troop movement that occurred into various portions of Vietnam uh, came down that road, and that road was in Cambodia and Laos. So the invasion of Cambodia, the intent was to stop the troop movement uh, with regard to uh, the North Vietnamese and their incursion into South Vietnam. But the reality is that was also a widening of the war, was it not? It, correct, it was a widening of the war, although uh, as we get into my story, you'll see that the war had been widened much earlier than that. But uh, at this point in time, that was considered to be a widening of the war. That's All right. correct. So uh, let's deal with the, the immediate duty. So you start out as a co-pilot. Uh, you're basically supporting the infantry as they go into Cambodia. Uh, are you flying troops directly into uh, yeah. the war zone? Flew troops directly into Cambodia. Uh, I was flying as what's called a co-pilot at that time because I was new and uh, Normally, you didn't become an aircraft captain until you were four or five months into your tour and became more proficient at how you were flying. Uh, 
I flew as a co-pilot on a mission my first day flying was a, a mission into Cambodia to put troops from the 4th Infantry Division in in Cambodia. All right, and, and uh, you, you basically run support for that operation? Once we put the troops in, then they needed resupply, they needed food, medical equipment, in some cases a medical evacuation for people that had been wounded. Uh, and so we did those kinds of things in support of that. And then when they left, we extracted the group. Okay, so you spent about a, a, a month on, on that particular yes, side of site? we were uh, temporarily assigned to them for a month, and then we moved back to our regular location, which was up in the central highlands of Vietnam and Pleiku, Vietnam. Okay, now in, in your, um, so you're flying as a co-pilot, what are the specific skills that you're learning? Well, essentially what you learn when you, you get out of flight school is you really don't know very much. Uh, and the pilots that have experience have experience going into uh, landing zones, how you do certain things that we were not taught in flight school. And you want to become much more proficient in the aircraft because the requirements when you're flying in combat are quite a bit different than if you're just flying out of the Renton Airport, for example, uh, and doing a little sightseeing. All right, uh, you, uh, uh, let's, let's look at uh, a, one of your uh, trips out of the uh, Pleiku Kantun area. So uh, who are you taking and where are you taking them and what are they trying to do? Our unit worked exclusively for what was uh, known at that time as a special, fifth special forces, which was actually, if you've heard the term Green Beret or Navy SEAL, uh, essentially it was that type of unit. They were located at a, right on the tri-border of the Vietnam, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia in a city called Kantum. And we would go up there daily, and then we would insert recon teams on the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos and Cambodia for the special forces. Normally they would have two special forces people and 10 mountain yard mercenaries. And mountain yards were indigenous people to the mountainous region of Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. All right, uh, uh, so uh, your, your, your unit the, the, uh, uh, has uh, basically 24 aircraft, and uh, are they all uh, just uh, transportation vehicles? Or? No, we had uh, the 24 units, we had eight helicopter gunships, uh, which were the old Huey type gunship, not the type of gunship that you would see today. And then we had 18 uh, aircraft to fly, troop insertion, resupply, uh, medevac, uh, virtually anything else you could think of that the special forces troops and, their, and, their, and the mountain yard mercenaries needed with regard to that. All right, but even as a support helicopter, the fact is you are armed. Is that correct? Uh, our helicopter, the troop insertion, I flew the troop insertion, not the gunships. So. The troop insertion uh, helicopters were uh, armed with two uh, machine guns, one on each door, uh, each side of the door, that were operated by a gunner and a crew chief for the aircraft. So the normal crew in the aircraft was a pilot, or the cap, aircraft captain, the co-pilot, uh, a door gunner, and a crew chief who was responsible for overseeing the maintenance and everything on the aircraft. All right, so uh, one of the problems with this type of operation is you don't have all the aircraft available all the time. What's, what's keeping them down? That's correct. Uh, with a helicopter, what you find out, uh, unlike a lot of aircraft, is it requires about two hours of maintenance for every hour you fly it. So if you flew the helicopter for eight hours, it requires 16 hours of maintenance to, to maintain uh, its flyability and stuff. Uh, so a large part of the rotation, we would have of the 24 aircraft every day, maybe 18 would be flying and six would be in maintenance. And uh, uh, within, so within your company, uh, you, uh, you got people actually working 24 hours a day. Yes, we did. We had, uh, the company is somewhere between 250 and 270 people uh, that were in the company. About 60 were pilots and the balance of them were really maintenance people uh, that were taking care of the aircraft. And they ran three shifts a day. They had a day shift, uh, 
a swing shift, and then a night shift. Okay. The uh, so uh, all right. If you're uh, going to run an insertion, um, um, how many helicopters? Is there anybody else involved? Uh, typically, we ran insertions over the border in Laos and Cambodia. Uh, we would have six to eight helicopter gunships that would be with us. Uh, when we would fly an insertion, if we had a 12-ship insertion uh, into a landing zone, uh, we would have six aircraft that had the people in it and six that were empty. In case somebody went down in the landing zone, there was a ship then to pick the people up. We also had uh, support from an Air Force controller who would be overhead. Uh, the unit that I flew in doesn't, didn't fly the typical uh, type of formation helicopter flying. If you uh, see a movie uh, at some point with regard to the war, they always show helicopters flying in formation. Uh, we did not fly that way. We flew at treetop level, at maximum speed of the aircraft, and uh, were guided into the landing zones we had by Air Force controllers. So unlike a, 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 a search and destroy mission, the insertion is about going into areas that you're not going to stay and you're basically in a, a very dangerous area because you're not even inside the, the uh, zone that the war is supposed to be going on. That's correct and, and you really never knew what we were going to run into. Uh, although, you know, they had relatively good intelligence from some bases that uh, the special forces had that were on the border or over the border in either Laos and Cambodia. We'd have some good intelligence, but uh, for sure you really never knew uh, what we were going to run into. So decisions are made about where another, is it a listening post? Uh, it might be a listening post. It could be a small base uh, where they would run small patrols out of. Uh, it might be a base with 10 or 12 special forces people that was pretty well disguised in the jungle and uh, they would run uh, patrols out of there and get in, gather intelligence. Uh, there were also listening devices dropped uh, from aircraft, not what we did, but from aircraft that actually provided uh, in intelligence information from sound and that kind of thing that were dropped on the Ho Chi Minh Trail itself. So, in essence, uh, one of these listening devices could uh, actually recognize a truck engine and recognize a convoy was coming down the road? That's correct. They could recognize, uh, whether it be a truck engine, a tank engine, or whatever it may be, uh, and the devices were pretty reliable with regard to that. So, basically, if you're the Vietnamese, you're, you want to stay out of the sight of aircraft, you're typically going to move at night. Uh, and what we have to do is have a means of basically locating where these people are and what they're doing? That was correct. Uh, they would move almost predominantly at night and then based on the intelligence that the special forces were able to gather, uh, we would put these strike teams in and they would disrupt them during the daytime, okay. basically. All right. Uh, in, uh, it, so uh, on, on a given day of an insertion, you, uh, you're actually running multiple missions, I mean, in terms of flights, is that correct? That's correct. You would probably do the insertion, uh, and then you would do resupply missions in between with the various bases that they had, and then you would get a call and they would want to be extracted out of the area that they were put in. All right, and what so time are you actually going out? In the morning? Yep. Uh, usually we left the flight line at 6 a.m. Okay. And uh, so now let's, let's say you inserted into Cambodia. You're now keeping in radio contact with these people so that you know their, their situation? Well, we keep in radio contact with their headquarters. Okay. So they keep in contact with the, the unit itself. All right. And uh, uh, so if it's uh, simple and they just uh, they, they, they want to install some gear or whatever, and now you're going to take them out at night. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky, we it's did, simply, not at night. Well, I, excuse me, it's got to be daylight. Yeah. But, but towards uh, the, the late afternoon, you're, uh, if you're lucky, it's quiet. They haven't made any uh, immediate contact. unit contact. 
But if not, now what happens? If not, you know, we, the, the extraction works the same way as the insertion. So we had helicopter gunships again. Uh, in some cases, we actually worked with uh, the Air Force in uh, an old fighter jet that's no longer around now, but F-4 Phantom. Uh, we would have Phantoms, and then in some cases, we actually worked with a Vietnamese group uh, that flew A1E Sky Raiders, which were a World War II aircraft that provided very good close ground support in terms of uh, both suppressing fire and uh, small bombs. Okay. All right. Uh, so you, uh, and then uh, one of the, the, the locales that you find yourself in contact with over time is Firebase 6. So what's, what's a Firebase? How close was it to you and what did it mean? Uh, Firebase 6 was a firebase that was located outside of Kontum. And what a firebase was is, the, as I said, you know, before I was an artillery officer. And what a firebase was, was a location where there were artillery, um, the big guns that fired very large shells. Uh, and they would be ensconced or, or, or settled in an area where they had... Uh, bunkers and that kind of thing to protect the individuals that were at the fire base, but they also uh, fired a large amount of munitions in support of infantry people. All right, and they're obviously going to be in areas where they're anticipating hostile uh, action. So what happened at Firebase? Well, uh, Firebase 6 was a fire base above Kontum where we, the special forces were located. And in the year I was in Vietnam, it changed hands between the United States and the Vietnamese uh, five times. And so the Vietnamese would have it for a while, North Vietnamese, and the United States would take it back. We would abandon the base. They would take it over again. Then we would go in and take it back. And we ran a lot of resupply missions and medevac missions uh, in that particular area. And, uh, and that's actually relatively close to your uh, home uh, base? Well, it was, uh, from the, where the Special Forces was based, it was probably three miles. Okay. So uh, uh, and now over time, the, the uh, Vietnamization of the wars is uh, beginning to take place. Uh, that was President Nixon about 1971 or so? Correct. In the area we were in, uh, we were the, actually the only American units up there. We had uh, three different helicopter companies. Uh, were stationed at this base we were at, uh, at Pleiku, but we had no infantry in support of us other than the Vietnamese infantry units. So, and so we would have to do our own guard duty in, at night. Did uh, you draw that duty? Yes, I drew it at least once a month. Okay, and that's... Not, it's not your favorite thing. Uh, you're out there at a guard post by yourself in the total darkness, and you have no idea uh, what you may or may not confront at some point. All right, now in terms of the various uh, listening posts that are being established along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, there are different types of terrain and one of them you said uh, earlier in a conversation was actually uh, up on a 10,000 foot uh, mountaintop? Yes, uh, the Central Highlands, were, if you look at a map of Vietnam, uh, in the tri what's called the tri-border area where Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia converge, it's very mountainous there. And it, it, w it, reminded, it would remind you of the Cascades and flying into the Cascades, uh, other than the temperature. Uh, and so the Special Forces had a, a listening post that was on what was termed a pinnacle, which is basically a rock outcropping that went up about 10,000 feet and we would have to supply that. It wasn't a, a, a base that anybody could attack because they couldn't get there. So you had to only get there by helicopter and we had to supply it, resupply them at least once a week. Okay, so one of the uh, things that I heard in an earlier conversation with you was there's limitations on the crap. What's the ceiling limit for a Huey? Well, the Army said it's 8,000 feet. Uh, we figured that it was 10,000 feet, so we were able to go ahead and do that. We felt the Army probably put a 20% uh, margin in for error for people like us. But it does mean you're stretching the limits of the Stretch machine. Stretch the limits of the aircraft. And uh, it does mean that people are dependent on your being able to do that. 
That's correct. I mean, they had no other way of resupply other than uh, what we would do with them. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, um, uh, you've now, uh, you've become, uh, you're a captain of your craft. Uh, you've now been in country nine months and you get yet another assignment. What's that? Yes, because I was a, what was termed a regular line officer, my, actually my rank was a captain. And so uh, when I became a captain, uh, we had the executive officer for the unit uh, came back home. His tour of duty of 12 months was up and I was appointed as the executive officer uh, for the last two and a half, three months I was there. All right, now that's a pretty dramatic change from basically uh, going and getting your briefing about the mission and tomorrow it's all aircraft and now what's going to happen? Well, I occasionally was able to fly, but uh, the majority of things I did were administrative. Uh, the company commander, the head of the unit, uh, was a major and I worked directly for him. Uh, so I had the responsibility to oversee everything he wanted done. Uh, plus oversee all the like supply officers, uh, flight officers, uh, virtually anything they wanted. It was kind of like being the vice president of a, a company. So you're tracking all the details and you have to make sure people are assigned to aircraft and that you got aircraft available and that's correct. I assisted the flight officer in scheduling uh, the supply FDU. officer in terms of making sure we had the right supplies for, for maintenance purposes, for uh, feeding troops, that kind of thing. Now, before we leave all your flight experience, I, I, I do want to go back to one thing. We, uh, a, a normal commercial pilot today uh, basically uh, has uh, how many uh, flight hours uh, limit uh, for? A, a commercial pilot today for a major airline, I think, is at 60 hours a month. Okay, but you're in the military. Uh, what's an Air Force? Uh, well, they didn't base it based on hours. They based it on what was called sorties, which would be a, essentially a, a takeoff and a landing somewhere. And they would fly over in Vietnam somewhere around 30 sorties a month. Okay, but you're which might be four and five in one day. Okay, but you're a helicopter pilot. Right. Still about hours. What's the difference in your... Uh, we would fly anywhere, for example, from 180 to 200 hours or 220 hours a month. Now you mentioned that, that one of your problems is there's you end up on uh, uh, standby duty uh, and emergency tactical calls are, are put in? Yes. Um, so uh, let's, let's take an example of what that really means to, to people. So I've got an, uh, a... a, a, a platoon that's out on the border. They've encountered themselves in a firefight. Looks like they're maybe outnumbered. Night's coming on. What are you going to end up doing? Well, at that point in time, we'd either try and do an extraction to get him out of there, or uh, we did have one uh, circumstance that we all got once a month, uh, whether we wanted it or not, uh, which was to fly what was called flare ship. And uh, what the flare ship was is it was one ship that was dedicated at night uh, to assist units that got in contact with the Vietnamese during darkness. And we would fly out and drop flares uh, on parachutes out of the helicopter to try and light the area for them uh, so that they could counterattack uh, whatever unit they were dealing with. Uh, and how do the flares go out and how low do you have to be to well, make them the work? Well, the crew chief and the gunner would throw the flares out and there would be a, a D ring, which is a ring that's just a small ring and there would be a rope attached to that. It would go out of the aircraft and drop about 500 feet and a parachute would open up and then it would light up. Okay, so the problem with it is, is in order to do that effectively, you've got to be close to where the firefight's going on. That's correct. And the problem, all the, the second problem was that it also lit the aircraft up pretty well at night. So uh, you'd start looking for what we term tracers coming up uh, at that point in time. And you look for red ones, which were small arms fire, or green ones, which were large caliber fire. Uh, time to shift uh, where you're stationed. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, and 
there's also the impact of climate on flying, and there's two seasons in the Highlands. What what are we dealing with in the right in the Central Highlands where we were in the in the tribe warrior area, border area of Cambodia and Laos and and Vietnam, in the mountains we have what they have what's called the monsoon season. So you have it's very seasonal climate, uh, particularly with regard to heavy rainfall. So we had to be very careful certain times of year about how we were flying and where we were flying uh, based on weather forecasts. And you also would encounter in the afternoons uh, during the monsoon season, a number of thunderstorms, which is not good in a helicopter. Uh, right, so they're not what, built for that. What's the impact for you as, as a pilot? I mean, you're, 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 you're stuck and, and you have to deal with it. I mean, you have to deal with it. You had to do the mission. Uh, but you also have to make sure everybody gets back too. Uh, so you have to you use your judgment, best judgment, uh, about the best way to do that is, or what the best way to do it is, and then you know try and work around the weather as as need be. Right. But did you actually find yourself with low ceilings where, in and you're basically you got to stay low, uh, just in your own security? How, how are you finding your way back? Uh, from Pleiku, where we were based, to Kontum, where the Special Forces base were based, was 20 miles. And I can tell you that I have been five feet off that road more than once, uh, trying to get back to our base in Pleiku from Kontum. Okay, so it, it's it's doing the job with the circumstances you're encountering. That's correct. All right, um, you actually even had one engine failure. Is that correct? Yes, I did, but I was fortunate it was at a hover. And so we were able to get the aircraft down without any uh, issues. Okay, but I, it, it, that's a good example about understanding the limits of the aircraft. What was your key that there was something wrong? That's correct. We, uh, a helicopter, the Huey helicopter, was powered by a turbine engine. And uh, turbines uh, are very high heat engines that. Uh, when the exhaust comes out of the engine, you can measure the temperature that it comes out at. If it would be like driving a car and measuring the temperature out of your exhaust pipe. What we watched when we were in the helicopters is the temperature of that gas that was coming out of the back end of it. The, the, and so what we would do is we would mark down the beginning of each day when you flew once the helicopter was warmed up, you marked the, what was called the exhaust gas temperature down, and then we would check that throughout the day. And the concern was that if the exhaust gas temperature went up during the day, you were more likely to have an engine failure. So we watched that very closely. And uh, when we had the engine failure, we had been watching it because it had gone up by some 35 degrees. And so we were prepared for it when it happened. All right, so uh, under uh, military policy at that period of time, after you served your 12 months in country, mm -hmm. uh, you then got rotated home. Yes, I had a total, because I went into the flight program, I had a total of a four-year obligation. Had it been drafted, uh, like we talked about earlier, it was a two-year obligation. But because I had gone through flight school, I had a four-year obligation with the Army, so I had to do a, a two additional years, and I ended up at Fort Knox, Kentucky when I returned home. Well, now the military obviously wants to take advantage of the, the skills and knowledge that you have, and they attempt to uh, ask you to take on what kind of uh, positions? Well, uh, they want me to take on an, a, a basic training company, and I didn't really want to do that because I had, uh, uh, you know, I had no intention of staying in the military. If, it been, if I had intended to stay in, it would have been good for my career to do that. Uh, they had an air cab unit there that was full at the time. So I ended up at the Armor and Engineer Board at Fort Knox, Kentucky, which turned out to be actually a really fun job because we tested equipment uh, that the Army was considering purchasing. And so we had a, my particular test, the two years I was there, was on a portable refueling system. Uh, one of the problems that we had in Vietnam was that fueling systems or fueling areas for helicopters were generally in stationary locations. And so the Army needed to develop a system where uh, they could haul uh, the aircraft fuel or the jet fuel that was used in the helicopter to a temporary location. 
And so I ended up with the test for that particular uh, that particular product. We also tested things like a, we had a dune buggy that, that was kind of a predecessor of a, a vehicle that eventually the Army bought, which was the Hummer. Uh, and then we had another one that uh, was a laser sighting thing for tanks, which uh, was an early on laser uh, determining the range that somebody was going to shoot the, the tank gun. Uh, and that had a few problems with it in that the Army didn't realize that it would burn people's retina when it came back in. So uh, they ended up, the big advancement to that test was goggles that were protecting the eyes for people. So uh, it just, if I can, just to help sort that out. So a laser sight helps you determine the range of the target so that your elevation of the gun will guarantee a shot that will go directly to where you've scoped it? That's correct. So, so it, it's, uh, people use a laser pointer now. Uh, probably many of you students have a laser pointer that you use uh, at home uh, or you know, illegally flash at aircraft or something. Uh, but basically, it's to determine the range. And so the laser goes out hits the target and then it comes back into the site uh, where they can determine the exact distance and it actually accounts for wind and all that too. So, uh, You also, uh, uh, one of the things that was tested was a river bridge? Right, uh, the Army and Engineer Board uh, tested river bridge, uh, or river bridge is a, a bridge that is a temporary bridge that can be laid across a river that tanks can drive across, or trucks. And the river bridges that had been developed at that point in time dated to World War II. And so the Army needed to upgrade that technology, so they had a ribbon bridge test, and they actually conducted that test, even though we were at Fort Knox, Kentucky, that, that test was conducted on the Nesqually River at Fort Lewis. And the reason for that was that the current in the Nesqually River uh, is closest to the, the current in most rivers in Europe. And that was how they ended up at, at Fort Lewis. So that was looking at the Cold War and the possibility of a conflict in Europe? Yes. All right, uh, and sadly you also suffered another helicopter crash in this. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I needed to do when I got back uh, was to maintain my flight pay, which was, uh, believe me, in the military you won't get rich staying in the military. Uh, so I wanted to retain my flight pay, which I think was $125 a month at the time. And to do that, I needed to get four hours of uh, time a month. And there were no Hueys uh, at Fort Knox because they were all in Vietnam. So there were uh, air, the old aircraft that were there were actually Korean War vintage. And uh, one of the people I had flown with in Vietnam was an instructor pilot for an air cavalry unit at Fort Knox. By the way, uh, we need to explain what an air cavalry unit is. Air cavalry units are, you know, historically, uh, General Custer was a cavalry person. And uh, there are units that move, rather than staying in one position, they move frequently. And uh, Well, the, the catch word is mobility. Mobility, that's correct. And so in Vietnam, they they had their own helicopters. Uh, they would go in, do a mission, and they might do one mission and move to the next one the same day. Uh, unlike a lot of the military where you're stationary or in one particular area, the air cab troops move from one area to the other frequently. But what they're really trying to do is control ground in a given locale that's been a problem area. So that's correct. Okay. All right. So. It, uh, but so he's going to give me a, a check ride in the World War II or Korean War. It's a what's it called an OH-58. It's an old Bell helicopter, and uh, he's going to give me a check ride. And as we're going through the check ride, uh, a bird hit our tail rotor, and we lost the tail rotor. And that's a very bad thing in a helicopter because the tail rotor keeps it from rotating around itself. So we were able to keep enough forward airspeed into it. Uh, hit the ground, bounced about 50 feet up in the air, it crashed on its side. Uh, fortunately, the only injury we had was me standing on his ribs to get out of the aircraft to pull him out. So You're very lucky. Very lucky. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, 
that probably set off all kinds of alarms around the fort too. Didn't it, it did, and my wife, when I came home that day, uh, said, "Gee, there were a lot of sirens at the airport today." And I said, "I know, I was the cause of them." So yeah, she probably <laughs> didn't want to hear that. Yeah. All right, uh, you've now finally completed your obligation to the military. Um, you've decided you're going to come home. Uh, what are you looking at? Uh, my wife and I came back to Seattle, and, and none of you students were born during this period, but the economy has not always been that great in Seattle. And back in the 1970s, early 1970s, when I got out of the military, uh, there were signs up in Seattle that said, when you're the last person to leave, please turn out the lights. So I made some contacts with some people I knew, and uh, I was lucky enough to find a job, actually, uh, initially with Safeco Insurance. And uh, I worked there, and it was kind of like being in the military. The, uh, I actually was there only four days. Uh, I had to wear a white shirt. Uh, they ran similar to, to your students, when they ring the bell, you go for a break. Uh, that's how it was at Safeco Insurance as well. I had also interviewed for- Ring, a, ring a bell how often and for what? Well, 10 minute coffee breaks. Uh, every hour? About every hour, maybe every hour and a half. Okay. Uh, and I had also interviewed for a position with Ford uh, Motor Company. And uh, four days after I started, with Safeco, the people from Ford called and offered me a position in their training program. And uh, it was at twice the money I was making at Safeco and I didn't have to wear white shirts and listen to bells and it was not a hard decision for me to make to move on to Ford. Okay, so you're actually, uh, your uh, college degree in, uh, had a focus on marketing. So Correct. you're headed into the field you wanted to try? That I thought I was gonna be in forever. Okay, so. and what happened? <laughs> well, I. Worked for Ford. I went through the training program. Uh, went out as a what's called a field manager, which basically oversees a certain number of dealers in a particular region. Uh, and you kind of start with smaller dealers and work your way up to the larger dealers. I then got promoted to the merchandising manager for the district, where I was responsible for all sales promotion, dealer promotions, uh, advertising, marketing, those kinds of things, and. Uh, did pretty well, and then they, uh, with Ford, a promotion was to move to Detroit. Uh, I kind of decided at that point in time, I did not want to move my family to Detroit. By the way, how many kids have you got? I have two at that point in time, and that's all I've ever had is two, but. And their names are? Uh, Mike and Tanya. Okay. And uh, <coughs> we really didn't want to move. If you did well with Ford, it was like the military, you would have to move every 18 months to two years. And so, uh, I went and talked to an old friend of my father and I said, I think I'd like to get in the insurance business, but not through Safeco. Uh, and he said, well, you don't know if you can sell anything and you have to be able to sell in the insurance business, so go sell life insurance for a year. Uh, so I did that. And about a year later, uh, he called me and he said, really what you wanna be in is you wanna be in the, the area of employee benefits. So you wanna have be in the area of group insurance and where employers purchase uh, employee benefits for their uh, employees and provide health coverage and I'm sure a lot of your parents have health coverage through their employer that's kind of the area I work in all uh, right so if I can so there it, it, within that field you've got everything from you need dental insurance uh, some people have disability life uh, catastrophic catastrophic medical, uh, virtually everything you can think of, but on a group basis as opposed to individual basis. So uh, it was working with companies, basically. Uh, we have, a, there's three types of clients. Uh, one are corporate accounts, uh, would be like a Boeing or a Boise Cascade or whatever. Uh, another type of account we work with is uh, public entities, and that would be governmental entities. Uh, state governments, local governments, regional governments, school districts. We do a lot of school districts in our office. And then the third type we work with is uh, what are called Taft-Hartley plans. That's basically where unions bargain with management for benefits and we operate, uh, the tr uh, trust is set up, a trust is a pot of money and that's set up 
an equal number of labor and management trustees determine how that money is going to be spent to provide health insurance and dental and all that for for their members. All right, can I just toss in? A, yeah. Uh, so uh, if I was on that board of trustees, what I'll get is a request from a retired person and they need hearing aids and they're $5,000 a piece and the question is if they want an upgrade, will the trustee fund actually pay for that? That sort of thing? That's correct. Okay. And uh, all right, so eventually uh, you actually went out on your own. Right. Uh, I went to work. Uh, I worked for uh, Bankers Life, which is now a principal financial group, and got trained from 1976 to 78, and then went to work for uh, an insurance brokerage firm that specialized only in employee benefits. And uh, uh, I became a minority owner of that. Uh, that company was, we sold that company to a larger company uh, in 1988. And then uh, we bought that business back from the larger company in 1992 and formed our own company again and grew that. And then we merged uh, in 2008 with Propel Insurance, which is a local firm, a regional firm here in the Seattle area, are actually headquartered in Tacoma. Uh, we have seven offices in the Northwest. And roughly how many employees actually draw from the coverage that you make available? Oh boy. Uh -huh. Probably somewhere around a quarter of a million. Okay, so it's a it's a fairly sub substantial uh, practice, and it's principally for uh, Oregon and Washington. Is that uh, actually I do uh, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, and then I have uh, accounts in Chicago, uh, and I do consulting for one of the labor unions nationally on their healthcare stuff. So uh, you're a busy man and in the aircraft a great deal now. Is that yeah, correct? I mean, I uh, haven't gotten away from flying to that extent. Uh, I make uh, somewhere between 45 and 50 round trips a year uh, flying to see clients and going to various meetings and that kind of thing. Okay. Well, again, this has been conversations in the Vietnam War and uh, my special guest, Doug Toshby. And, and thank you so much, Doug. For Thanks, Tim.